Thank you. Look at this audience. Love, lo love this crowd. Because every time we come to Harshbhai's function, you get the feeling India is doing well. <laughs> and then you listen to the news and read the papers, and you think we are hopeless. So this is this is very uplifting. We are going to talk about sport today. We are going to talk about what works in sport, what doesn't work in sport. We'll try and link it to entrepreneurship as well, uh, because each slide is geared that way. But as you as you follow the next half hour, what we can guarantee you is it's true in sport. You check out whether it's true in your profession as well. That's how we'll play it. You know, resilience is such a beautiful theme, and so appropriate for today's times. And who knows resilience better than sports people? Because you just need to fail so many times and bounce back, and that goes into the making of a champion. So let's start. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? This is true of sport. You could have made 100 the previous day. You could have broken a world record the previous day. You go out to bat the next day, you still start on zero. And I suspect there's a few people in this room who will, who will relate to that. It's interesting, when you start on zero, your previous experience can come in handy. You've made 100 yesterday. You approach the, a new innings with confidence. You're still on zero, but there's confidence. You've done badly for a couple of innings. You go out and you're, you're completely different. You've made 100. You're looking at opportunities to score and grow from zero. You had a couple of ducks behind you. You're thinking, where's my run going to come from? And it's interesting, only recently, I was in a commentary box with Sunil Gavaskar. And as soon as the batsman got a single, he said, yes, he's off the mark. And I said, that's strange, coming from someone who's made 10,122 runs. He said, it doesn't matter. Every inning starts from zero. Every inning is like a new project. Every innings, you've got an equal chance of failing and succeeding. Every inning starts from zero. So that's, uh, that's, that, that's a big factor. Sometimes you can get complacent. Sometimes you can get overconfident. Sometimes you can get nervous. But every inning still starts from zero. And who knows that better than Virat Kohli, who came to the double hundred behind him, world's number one batsman the other day against little Bangladesh, and got out for a duck. Just a quick request from everybody. Uh, there'll be slides coming up there. You don't need to use your phones. They'll be all right. You know that old, that old uh, scientific piece of scientific research? When you've got things in your hand, your ears are not working? <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. So, we'd rather have you listen. Yeah, so a number of entrepreneurs, especially the older ones, you know, come from successful careers or successful, you know, other ventures. And while success is beautiful, like he said, you know, sometimes it comes with overconfidence, it comes with a bit of arrogance. So it's not to say that reputation or track record are not important. Of course, they're important. And there's also the psychological factor, you know, when you're facing a good batsman or you're facing a good bowler, of course, uh, all that is there. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the performance that matters on that day. You know, reputation can take you that, only that far, but you've got to keep performing, and which is why we say that, you know, every innings starts from zero. Even if you're Virat Kohli. There must be Virat yeah. Kohli's in this room as well, right? The equivalence of Virat Kohli's in this room. Now, we always have, have this picture because we leave it to people to ogle for about 10 seconds, because this is as close a picture to perfection as you can get if you're a cricket lover. But it's interesting that you think about Tendulkar, and I remember people telling me, yeah, wo chodo na. Sachin is Sachin, as if he could be Harsha. <laughs> I wouldn't mind, but it's, <laughs> it doesn't happen. We tend to place a lot of store on ability, on talent, and while talent is important, talent opens doors for you, it's interesting that in the long run, it's your attitude that wins you more matches, that allows you longevity, far, far more than ability does. In fact, it's your attitude that determines whether your ability takes you up or down. Attitude either drags your ability up or pulls the ability down. And we've seen that with so many people, vastly talented players, and suddenly you say, but what happened to them? And that's because their work ethic wasn't great, their talent had opened so many doors for them that they'd become fattened by their own talent. They didn't know what it was to scrap. We're going to talk about scrapping a lot because scrapping is a big part of success. It's not, a, it's not a flamboyant part of success, but it's, it's a big part of success. But at the very highest level, when you're getting the Tendulkars, you're getting the Vaughns, you're getting the Dravids, passion takes you to a completely different level. And, and, and passion is not as in what you see in Netflix videos. That's a different kind of passion. The passion is being obsessed about every little thing that can produce success for you. Knowing your own game inside out, 
I remember there was a game, if some of you watched the 2011 World Cup, Tendulkar was playing with a bat like some of, like the, some of us had, more plaster than wood on it. You remember all your bats as, as children? You couldn't afford another one, so you kept putting plaster. And after a while, there was more plaster than wood on the bat. And Tendulkar was playing with one of those. And we said, yeah. but he said he's Tendulkar, right? And then suddenly one day he comes out with a bat with no plaster on it. And then someone said, what happened? He said, no, in the previous game, I played a cover drive one yard to the left of cover. It was supposed to go for four, but he stopped it. He said, that means I need to change my bat. People are so, passion means knowing your own game inside out to such an extent. And I think that is what entrepreneurs do as well. You know your product categories, your markets inside out. That is what separates one from the other. It's a small story, but it tells you what makes the Tendulkas into Tendulkas. You know, so like uh, athletes bring ability, I think entrepreneurs also come with winning ideas. Uh, and the ability, of course, to, uh, you know, come up with those winning ideas. But to take the journey forward, you know, you need hard work, you need discipline, you need the ability to handle pressure, you need the ability to handle failure. And all these are really part of what we call attitude. And I remember, you know, going to Sachin when we wrote the book, I went and interviewed him and, you know, I asked him, so how does it feel to be the best player in the side for so many years? And you know, he, he didn't hesitate for a moment. He said, you know, I really don't look at ability because that is God-given. I look at, um, you know, the attitude that other players bring to the table uh, to see whether, you know, they do the 1% things right, whether they're great team players or not, whether they give it everything. And that is what I kind of check for. So even as leaders, you know, when you're building your teams, everybody looks at ability, but uh, attitude is going to be very important. Deep Kalra was telling me, in fact, you know, that he was telling me about attitude and how they kind of check out for people, whether they are team players, especially in senior positions. He said, you know, we interview them in different situations. So once at the office, once in a restaurant and in different situations and multiple people interview them so that, you know, we, have, we get a good uh, overview of whether they are going to be good, great team players or not. So attitude always in the long run more important than ability. Ability does the difficult things, attitude does the simple things. Simple things win more matches than difficult things. You see, we celebrate the people who do difficult things. Matches are won by people who do the simple things better because you can only do difficult things that often. It's the people who do the simple things more often that win in sport. You'll get the Messi's, you'll get the Ronaldo's, yes. But the Messi's and the Ronaldo's scrap on days as well. Which is why we say to be a champion, you should be able to adapt to all playing conditions. Sometimes you can get fattened by playing in easy conditions. Just the other day, there was an interview of Andy Roberts and he said, all these young fast bowlers, they want bouncy tracks, green pitches. He said, who learns on those? Because on those, the pitch is doing everything for you. Batsmen want to bat on flat decks because then the, the pitch is doing everything for you. You've, taken, you've defanged the bowler. It's like taking the fangs of a cobra and playing with it but you actually learn and you're valued as a sportsman and as an athlete if you've scored runs when the ball is doing that. That's the best test player of all time, even though in India we're not allowed to say that at all times. But that is the best test match batsman of currently. But even he has to score runs in conditions like those. So when we look at a batsman or we look at a bowler, the first thing we look at is a home and away record. How good are you at home? Home often translates into easy conditions. How good are you away? Away translates into tough conditions. And when you find players who've got very, got huge averages at home and ordinary averages away, they drop on the respect scale. When you've got a Rahul Dravid who averages 50 plus at home and 50 plus away, then you look and say, wow, that, that, that was something. So to be a champion, you have to play under all playing conditions. As I said, you get fattened by easy conditions. And then when you get into tough situations, that's when you realize what resilience really is. And that's why resilience is such a big factor in, in sport because you're not going to get these games every day. I remember Sachin once, it was a game I was broadcasting on and he was getting hit on the thigh, hit on the body, hit on the shoulder. And I remember saying on air, I said, here is the emperor walking the streets like a common man. He was batting like a common man. And when I asked him afterwards, he said, yes, but it was important for me. Even though it was bad, it was important for me to be in there. Hanging in there, it was important for me to hang in there. And I said, but you're Sachin. Sachin doesn't hang in there. He said, no, it was important that day. He took the blows, did everything, but he hung in there. And because he hung in there, taking all the blows, you realize that he went up in everyone's eyes because he showed another quality. 
That is why we value resilience so much. Resilience is critical because it allows you to be alive another day. If talent is all you've got, if you're fattened in home conditions, when the going gets tough, you're not around when the, when the tide changes. And that is why these are the people who sometimes enjoy tough situations. Because tough situations show the difference between class and the pretender. Fat, flat pitches, everyone scores runs, right? What's the difference between one and the other? When the going gets tough, the Tendulkas and Dravids and Kohli's look different. You know, so it's like a, in an easy exam, everybody scores. In an easy market, everybody's making money, right? To, so to differentiate between the great and the good, champions actually seek challenges. So you will find the marathoners always wanting to run in different altitudes, in different terrains, in different climatic conditions. You'll see in tennis why the Grand Slam is so valued. Because unless you have tested yourself in different situations, you don't really qualify as a champion. And unless you've, you know, if you're, if you're looking for longevity in your career, whether it's in business or in sport, you have to be adaptable and you have to be flexible so that if you won across conditions, then you become a champion. Longevity is a big thing, actually. Sometimes in the soundbite world that we live in, we live in the present. Longevity is a wonderful way of testing people, of assessing people, because it means you've gone through cycles. It means you've had to do well when you were in form and out of form, on good pitches and bad pitches, against good bowling and easy bowling, in easy conditions and in terrible conditions, on days when you're feeling top of the world, on days you've got a stomach upset, on days when your body is not listening to you. It's amazing how many days an athlete goes out and his body is not listening to him. They've got all kinds of niggles. Hardly ever does an elite athlete go out to play with his body obeying every single thing that he or she wants to do. So when you have longevity is such a beautiful way of assessing people, because as I said, it means you've been through so many cycles and you've survived. And survival and longevity are beautiful things. One of our, one of our recent heroes, lovely young man, started off with great promise, used to hammer the white ball out of sight, and when he was 25, 30, he hit one up in the air. And we said, yeah, there's, there's another guy. Yeah. He's like a firecracker, you know, boom, 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 and gone. And then he discovered, no, there's, there's more to life than that. He went through a very difficult phase, but the difficult phases tend to strengthen us. What is the reason he's come out here and scored two double hundreds straight away? Because he knows what it is to just make 30s and fail. Now suddenly he's making hundreds, he's making double hundreds, he's hanging in there, his captain is asking for a triple hundred. Champions emerge stronger from challenges. Here's a young man who's now on his way up. It happens with great teams as well. Sometimes teams win so much that they don't know what to do when they fall back. Because they're so used to being front runners, they're so used to winning, the moment there's a challenge, they're on unfamiliar ground. It happened to the Australians. 2005, Australia didn't know what it was to lose. They went to England in 2005. It was almost as if a generation of English boys had been taught in school that you're not allowed to win against Australia. They didn't know what it was. 18, 19 years, they hadn't beaten them. Australia fell back, they couldn't come back. They lost the series, they couldn't come back in that series because when you're the front runner, when you're winning everything, you're not used to adversity. You don't know what to do when adversity hits you in the face. But what did the champion side that they are do after that? They realized there is a weakness in us that we did not know. Challenges highlight the weaknesses that are not always apparent. And as a champion, when you plug that weakness, you're now even more difficult to beat. And that's why champions come back stronger from challenges. What did the West Indies do after India beat them in the 83 World Cup final? The rest of the world hated India with a passion. Because the West Indies just beat everybody out of sight after that. They realized if they go into a game with even the mildest complacence, they will lose. That day the champagne was in the West Indies dressing room already. And then Kapil they went across and said, maybe you can lend us some because you won't need this now. <laughs> complacence is a weakness in teams. When you're winning constantly, overconfidence, complacent, these, these can come in. Australia lost in 2005. In the next 18 months, they won the Ashes 5-0, they won the Champions Trophy, and they made a mockery of the 2007 World Cup. The most one-sided, boring, hopeless World Cup there's ever been. Because Australia was just not challenged. Champion teams, when they are beaten or when they face a challenge, realize there was a weakness they didn't know, and they come back even stronger. You know, risk and therefore failure are at the heart of entrepreneurship as also sport. In sport, you know, you fail more than you win. 
And when you fail, I mean, even somebody like Sachin has failed more than he has won, and yet you kind of, you know, remember only the centuries. So that's the good bit. So success is not forever, not forever, but failure is also not fatal. You live to see another day. And Paddy Upton, you know, who used to be, who's, who's trained a lot of high performance teams, and he used to be uh, one of the coaches of Rajasthan Royals, he was telling us how they do it in sport. So those who have this fear of failure, they keep asking them, you know, so what's the worst that can happen? So you'll get dropped in the next match? Okay, so? So you might lose an IPL contract? So? And they, you know, break it down into smaller things just for people to realize that it's not the end. You live to be, to, you, you live to see another day. You live to enjoy the fruits later. So failure is not fatal at all. Size isn't everything. It's a strange thing to say to an audience where scale is everything, right? But we have New Zealand over there, and New Zealand is a very small country with a very small pool of players. Cricket is not even the number one sport, nowhere near the number one sport. And yet, you know, you will find that New Zealand, in spite of being a fairly okay team on paper, they do much better than what is expected of them. As they say in sport, you know, they punch above their weight. As it, isn't that uh, also something that entrepreneurs do? Yeah, with limited resources. Sometimes, you know, they say, don't have a penny in your pocket, but your dream, your aspiration is to change the world. So the aspirations are so much higher than resources that resources don't look that important. It's your resourcefulness. You know, things like a frugality mindset that are more important. So what you do with your resources like New Zealand does. You know, we all came out of, of business school, almost management school rather. One of our professors said, never ever call it business school, it's management school. Almost trained to be product managers in business, in finance and whatever. And for us, growth from X was 1.1 X. I'm told for entrepreneurs, growth is X to 10 X, right? Not 1.1 X, but 10 X. But that, that's what entrepreneurs are good at doing. That's what New Zealand are very good at doing. They don't have too many resources. You know how many people play first class cricket in New Zealand? New Zealand has six teams, that's 66 players on the field, some reserves, 80, 85 players out of those 30, 35, 40 are never going to be good enough to play international cricket. Their pool is 35 or 40 players. Out of 35 or 40 players, they have to compete at the world, world level and rely on a count back of boundaries not to be World Cup champions. Isn't that incredible? By the way, India outraged more than New Zealand. Okay, New Zealand accepted the result, but because we are trained to be angry about everything, we were the country that got angry, not New Zealand. Anger is our now national nine o'clock prime time resource. <laughs> so, how can you misbehave in people's houses? Right? As an anchor, I was told, I go into people's houses. How can you misbehave in people's houses? But that's a different story. So size isn't, is, isn't everything. Sometimes it's not about the resources that you have. It's important to have resources, but resources can be overrated. Sometimes when you have too many resources, you tend to become a little flabby. It's like the kids who had too much pocket money at school and you only had very little, but your pocket money went further than theirs. We, were give, we had 10 rupees, the other 10 rupees at most. But 10 rupees, every, every 10 paisa went, went a long distance because you learned to make the most of what you had. Stephen Fleming had come to a book launch. Stephen Fleming was captain of New Zealand and a very fine coach. He said, I came to the IPL and I didn't know what to do with all the talent that I saw because we'd never seen talent like that before. As children, we were told, make the most of what you have because that's all you have. We used to joke that the only reason New Zealand won was by the time people got to New Zealand, they didn't even know where they were. But resources versus resourcefulness, that's why. And wh who, is, who symbolizes that the most? Why is he one of the most admired cricketers? How many people thought Anil Kumble will take 619 wickets? What resources did he have? Did he bowl magical balls that wickedly went outside the leg stump, turned back, hit top of off stump? No, all our lives we focused on what he cannot do, right? All of us said, but he doesn't turn the ball. You don't play cricket to turn a ball. You play cricket to take a wicket. But he took 619 wickets. Because you learn to make the most of what you have. And sometimes when you learn to make the most of what you have, you're automatically humble. And humility is a far bigger value, a virtue than most of us think it is. But New Zealand are a fabulous, fab fabulous team. Best players, do they always make the best captains? Brian Lara was made captain of New Zealand. 
Tendulkar has been captain of India. Kohli has been captain of India. By some distance, the best players. Gary Sobers was captain of South of the West Indies. Ian Botham was captain of of England. We always make our best performing executive into the manager and then the CEO, right? But the skills you need to be the best player are different from the skills that you need to be a leader. When you are the best player, the game comes a certain way to you. You find gaps where other people don't see them. You know, they say that talent is about hitting the goal that no one else can hit, but genius is about hitting the goals that no one else can see. And so very often when you've got the best player as the leader, the player tends to weigh everybody else in the scales that he weighs himself or herself in. And as a result, most people tend to fall short. The other thing with leadership also is can you understand the people working for you? Are they coming to work with an EMI? If you've never ever had an EMI, how do you know what happens if you delay salaries by a week and the EMIs hit the bank? But the guy who's coming to work or the lady who's coming to work has EMIs as well. The guys who are going out to play are worried about their future too. The person coming out to bat or bowl is not just a cricketer, he's a human who's carrying his or her worries onto the ground. If you've never had those worries, how do you understand those? And that's why we often say the best player might make the best captain, but doesn't necessarily make the best captain. And I wonder if that happens with entrepreneurs as well. Because you're so driven, because you see your industry the way you do, do you assume that everybody else automatically must? And therefore you have very little patience with people who are not at your level? So that can happen. You know, players like this, Lara or Tendulkar, are what we call supreme individualists. And their genius really lies in knowing their game inside out and on being on top of their game. So sometimes what happens is, you know, they're so happy being themselves and being with themselves that they are very burdened by other people. You know, very hassled. So leadership is a lot about, you know, like he said, understanding people, managing people, you know, bringing the best out of your team. So sometimes that burden is a little too much, which is why we say, you know, that the best test of leadership is to see whether you feel buoyed up with the additional responsibility or do you feel weighed down? If you feel weighed down by the HR stuff, as they say, you know, managing people and things like that, then leadership is not for that person. So leadership yeah. also is about, you know, different skills. You, it requires a lot more skills, the skills like communication, skills like collaboration. And you'll see that, you know, the IPL captains, for example, are a lot more savvy now because they no, need to do all these things. And communication is something that's critical to an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur leader. Because if you have to share your vision, if you have to inspire your team, if you have to attract talent, then you need to be a good communicator. Similarly for, you know, collaboration, you should be able to work with other people because, you know, individuals win matches, but teams win championships. So if you want to win the championship, your team must be great. So these are skills that uh, are critical, but people don't give it that much importance. So the individuals set up world records where their teams don't win sometimes. So it's a great line that actually. Trust is one of the strongest weapons in leaders arsenal. I'll tell you a little bit back background to this story. This on the fourth evening of the test match in Kolkata, that test match in Kolkata, 2001, Lakshman and Dravid have batted the whole day and India from a position of losing the series are now suddenly faced with the unthinkable. Maybe we can win. And that evening in Soro's house, I said, so what's your plan tomorrow? And he said, of course we're going to win. As if they say, what on earth is he asking me? And he said, I'll tell you how we are going to win. And he called this little Sadaji with the beard just about sprouting like my garden lawn might when we were in Hyderabad. And he called him and said, not only are we going to win, but he is going to win it for me tomorrow. He's about two, three test matches old. He's just finding his way around. And I'm thinking, how does he react to the captain telling him, you are going to win me tomorrow? Is he thinking, mar gaye? <laughs> or is he thinking, oh, the captain ne bola hai? How does he react to the captain telling him that? That is what defines leadership. Do I trust implicitly in my captain and does the captain's belief in me make me, a tw make me twice the player or do I get pressured by what the captain is telling me because yeah, so trust is the strongest element we've talked to so many cricket captains around the world and we said what is the one quality a leader must possess it's amazing how often they say trust and honesty it's amazing how often that word comes through so Ganguly is considered one of India's best cricket captains and this had uh, a big part to play in that. So maybe a decade ago, we did a program called Masterstrokes 
on CNBC and we had a corporate head and a cricketer and we had discussions on you know, leadership and team building and execution and things like that. So Ganguly uh, was at the peak of his leadership at that time and so we had him on the leadership episode. And uh, then he talked about decision making and he said, you know, normally leaders get about seven decisions out of 10. So Harsha asked him, how do you rate yourself? And he said, maybe five out of 10, maybe he was being modest, we don't know. But then he said that, you know, the best thing is that my team trusts me uh, to believe that I made a mistake in trying to do what was best for the team. And that's a great place for a leader to be, that if the team trusts you, because, you know, leaders make mistakes, but if the team trusts you, then that's great. And you have a lot of situations where leaders have to demand difficult things from um, your team without really having anything to offer them in return. And that's when trust really uh, is useful. Interesting one, because as leaders, we have to demand things, right? And often we can't, as she said, can't give it back, can't give them anything in return. That is when trust is so important, yeah. And finally, you know, when we talk to a lot of leaders, you will find two things, at least we found two things that they always possess. One is optimism, and the other is the focus on winning. I think optimism is extremely important for a leader because at all times, especially difficult times, the eyes are on the leader. And if you find that the leader has his head down or the drooping shoulders or chewing nails, then people have very little confidence. So when you look at the leader, you should feel confidence. And of course, focus on winning because I think there's so many distractions like, you know, funding and people movement and media and stuff like that. But you'll find, and they say about all great captains like uh, Ganguly or Dhoni or Imran Khan, that they never ever lost uh, their focus on winning. They were always focused on the game. It's okay to say Imran Khan was a great leader, right, as a cricket captain. I hope we never reach a stage where we cannot acknowledge that in society. He was one of the greatest captains the game has ever known, but he's in a different role now. Why that photograph? That comes from the very first year of the IPL, and I'll end with that little story. Very first year of the IPL, some of you remember Rajasthan Royals won. Rajasthan Royals were three or four players and seven children in that team. They had no business winning. They were led by a gruff talking Australian and they had people in their team who barely understood an Indian accent, let alone an Aussie accent. And so that game is from a game in Jaipur where 140-150 was a very good score. It was a really go-to-sleep kind of pitch. 140-150, Mumbai Indians have made that. Rajasthan Royals, you can see the first Mumbai Indians costume at the back. Shane Warne before he met Elizabeth Hurley, so a little bit around the middle as well. <laughs> and they made 140-150. And Rajasthan Royals are 80, 90 for five. So the bottom five have to make almost as much as the top five in fewer overs on a bad pitch. The game was over. Rajasthan Royals won. There were two young, there were two very young players playing. One from Gujarat. The other was an 18-year-old kid from Saurashtra called Ravindra Jadeja. And after the game was over, we asked them, "How did you believe you can win? Because everything was against you. You're two kids against the might of Mumbai Indians. How did you win?" He said, "Wo kya hai na ke." Sen bhai ne humko bola tha pehle se. Sen bhai ne. Sen bhai. Wo jo photo mein hai na Sen bhai. Sen bhai ne humko bola tha pehle se. Kuhi kuch bhi hove jitne ka socho. Baaki ka baat mein. So here's a guy in a gruff accent saying you never ever lose the focus on winning. Whatever the situation you are in, first accept that situation. If you complain about the situation, you're never going to win. First accept the situation that you're in and say, right, now that I'm in this situation, how can I win? Who can I target? Which bowler can I score? I can't hit boundaries. Can I run too hard? You immediately start becoming positive about the idea of winning if you've accepted the situation that you're in. And when the leader is positive and optimistic, it doesn't matter if the people down the line come from a different background. It's amazing how that positivity and optimism stretched all the way down. And that is what leaders can do. I think in entrepreneur-driven companies as well, you are so much at a different level than everybody else that maybe you need to carry the youngsters along in your team as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much.